just me being confused, that's all. <laughs> Trying to resolve my confusion. So we're going to, we're going to do the, the two talks all in one. Um, and I think this type of, these type of classifications, the top was orientation. I'm not sure that's a useful concept or not, but at the time it was thought to be mechanically useful, the Powell's classification. And I, th I think the Herbert classification is very useful because it, get, it gets into issues like stability and fibrous union. I mean, he, he had a good sense of the things that matter, I think. Uh, but it, it gets a little overwhelming having so many different types to look at. And then you see a picture like this where, where people are trying to break it into fifths or areas that are probably too small to resolve reliably and accurately, even with modern imaging. So I, for me, classification is simple. It, it, almost all of them are waste fractures. If you try to study scaphoids and you try to study, study proximal polar distal tubercle, good luck. They're very, very uncommon. I've been trying to study them for 15 years. And even the waste fractures aren't as common as, as we think. But almost most of it's waste. There are um, some tubercle fractures. This one, uh, and then you know, they're often smaller than that, and the proximal pole fractures. And trying to figure out the line between proximal pole and waste sometimes is not easy. We're working on that as well. And the, the key element, I think, that we've recognized is displacement. I'll talk about instability as well. That's a a little bit less clear, but a fracture with a crack in, uh, in it, you know, bone with a crack in it, and, and the analogy I use is like a, a broken bat, a baseball player swings and breaks his bat. It looks like a good bat to you and I, but he goes and gets another one. It's got a crack in it. It won't, doesn't work as well, but it's solid. It's a, you can swing it um, as opposed to one that shatters and flies across the field. That's, so that's a displaced fracture versus a non-displaced fracture. So how do we define displacement? There's a bit of argument on that, and how do we measure it? I, I, I define it more or less as I just described, it, whether it's still t together as one bone or not. And the problem is, you know, you, you, the case, again, it's just confusion. So this is a person I took care of, and at first I'm not even sure the guy has a fracture. And then, but if you look close, you can see a, you can see a fracture. It's hard to see. There's no translation. There's no uh, signet ring sign. There's no DZ. I'll go back. There's no DZ. And that's a CT scan. And, and, and Bob Strauch wrote an evidence-based medicine article that I recommend to you f that for me because he was trying to deal with this. I mean, if this one obviously has a translation volarly. This is clearly unstable and displaced. But you'll see some of these impacted. Or if it's impacted and angulated and angled at the top but stable, if it moves as one and angled at the top, is that displaced or non-displaced? How much of a gap is displacement? This is probably about one or two millimeters, but is one too much? So we don't, we don't really know. But uh, I, I think this fracture has a different prognosis than the ones that are just a crack. And this is what it looks like when you look through the mid-carpal joint. You can move it around and stick a probe in it, and it's gapped and, and moved apart. Now this, so we got interested in this, and what, what we do is we just talk with people about it, meetings like this. I may, somebody may come up to me after this talk, and we say this is what we're looking at, this is what we're interested in. Well, there was a, a group in Sweden. They were uh, Danish guys in Sweden that were doing this study it's a pretty crazy study. You can do different things in different cultures. They scoped every single fracture. They scoped suspected fractures. They scoped everything. And it was part of a protocol to look at these things. So they had this fracture, which I think would all, everybody would agree is hard to see. I had to put a big arrow on there. And then look at it on a CT scan. I mean, that is very hard to see. And I, it, it's a decent cut. Maybe there are other cuts. I, and, it, and then you open up, and then that looks – there's cartilage intact here. And you can't move it. So that's, I think that counts as a, as a non-displaced fracture. And then here's one. You can see it a little bit more, but still not very impressive. Still not impressive on the CT scan. And this one moves. So well, what this means, I don't know. But when we looked at their data, and then we had some data where we, where we did some of them, um, we offered people surgery. And then when they did surgery, we scoped them as well. Uh, uh, but we didn't uh, scope every uh, fracture. But we put our data together. And we found that there were fractures that were unstable that were non-displaced on CT scan. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't, does that affect healing or prognosis? Does that guide treatment? Nobody knows. That's a totally unanswered question. I, personally, if I see this on a CT scan, I'm going to recommend non-operative treatment. But there is this issue to be resolved. So I think 
it's, the classification is relatively straightforward. We're mostly talking about waste fractures. The distal ones are mostly, uh, the tubercle or the different from the distal waste. And then the proximal polar, an unusual uh, type of fracture that we're not sure right where the cutoff point is. The displacement is the most important factor in union and prognosis, but we don't have a reference standard for displacement, and we're not sure how to de define it and how to measure it. The best we can do is CT scan in the plane of the scaphoid, but even that isn't perfect. The next step, we're looking at whether, whether we could see movement on a fluoroscopy. So we're, we're starting to enroll people and get a CT scan as sort of the reference standard, uh, not doing scope on everybody, and then putting under the fluoro in the office and seeing whether we can see it move. Very Only enrolled one or two patients in that, but th that's the kind of things that we're thinking about. And then it's a long way off from deciding whether what that has anything to do with uh, prognosis. 